Welcome to the last word. Has the Supreme Court's order asking the Italian ambassador to explain his government's decision not to return the Marines and restraining him from leaving the country further complicated an already difficult situation? And is there a danger it could now possibly spiral out of control? That's with former Attorney General and Solicitor General Soli Sorabji, former Foreign Secretary Kamal Sibyl, and one of India's most distinguished former ambassadors and columnists, M.K. Bhadra Kumar. Gentlemen, let's start with the Supreme Court order of earlier today. Kamal Sibyl, under Article 32.3 of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, when the Italian ambassador approached the Supreme Court seeking permission for the Italian Marines to return home for four weeks, ipso facto, he submitted himself to the jurisdiction of the court and therefore also in that process waived his immunity. Now, the critical question is, does this give the court the right to demand an explanation from his government for its refusal to return the Marines, which would breach the undertaking? Well, the latter part of your question is correct. I think the Supreme Court is within its right uh, to ask for an explanation since he filed an affidavit. But with regard to the first part of your question, no. His uh, immunity is not waived because for immunity to be waived, there has to be an express waiver. And that express waiver has to be given uh, by the government of Italy. So there is nothing so far that suggests that any such express waiver has been given. And without that, his diplomatic immunity remains intact. All right, just to clarify for an audience that is a layman and not necessarily in tune with the details of the Vienna Convention, you're saying that the Supreme Court has every right to demand an explanation of what looks like a breach of the ambassador's undertaking made to the court. Can you confirm that part for me first? Yes, of course. Of course, since he voluntarily submitted himself to the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court on instructions from his government, and since the commitment was not honored, so the Supreme Court is within its right to ask the ambassador to give an explanation on behalf of the Italian government why that commitment okay. is not being honored. Now, Mr. Bhatra Kumar, the bigger problem arises when the Supreme Court goes on to order the Italian ambassador not to leave India. The question is, what would happen if the envoy chooses to leave the country in the next 24 or 36 hours? Under the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations, he has every right to leave the country whenever he wants. But if the Supreme Court order is to be enforced, the government would have to restrain him. Can the government enforce that order and restrain him without breaching the Vienna Convention? No, as the uh, Foreign Secretary pointed out, that uh, unless there is a waiver from Rome, his uh, status uh, cannot be touched at all, and he enjoys full immunity. But uh, we have to be realistic here. I think the Italian uh, side would have uh, foreseen uh, these kind of developments coming up, and they would have probably even four or five steps further ahead, and they would have uh, drawn up their uh, backup plans. Well, well let's, let's, now, let's stop there. Let's stop there. Let's not speculate. Can, can I stop you? Let's not speculate at this moment about what backup plans the Italians have, because we don't know about them. I want to narrow this down first to an understanding of the legal position and the s position in terms of the Vienna Convention. You're agreeing with what Kamal Sibyl said a moment ago, that under the terms of the Vienna Absolutely. Convention, Absolutely. the Supreme Court order cannot be enforced by the government without breaching the Vienna Convention. Can you quickly confirm that for me, Mr. Bhadra Kumar? Abs absolutely, 100 percent, yes. Now, Mr. Surabji is with us. Mr. Surabji, you're a former attorney general. You're a former solicitor general as well. The problem arises in the fact that Article 32.4 of the Vienna Convention, that's Article 32.4, distinguishes between waiver of immunity from jurisdiction and waiver of immunity in respect of the execution of either an order or a judgment. And the problem is that that second waiver has to be granted by the Italian government itself. And in the absence of that second waiver, any step taken by the government to enforce the Supreme Court order that the ambassador mustn't leave the country would be a breach of the Vienna Convention. Now, would the Supreme Court accept that? Or does it have some remedy that overrules the Vienna Convention? I think it's a misconception, Karan, 
Question is, he approached the court on behalf of the government and gave an undertaking. Please appreciate the significance of an undertaking. He didn't agree. He didn't give an assurance. An undertaking means, in legal parlance, and everyone knows he was represented by senior counsel, undertaking is a promise to the court that in receipt of some benefit or concession, he do certain acts. Now, he wanted a concession. He wanted a benefit. The Marine should be allowed to leave. He got that benefit on the basis of the undertaking, and if he doesn't comply with that undertaking, it will be really playing fraud on the court and really subverting the dignity of our judicial institutions, in All this right. case, the Supreme Court. I understand. Now, about the waiver part, if I may just come in. If uh, I may just come in. Yeah. Maybe, Mr. Sibyl, in other words, right, it can be waived in a certain manner. The point is, because of his act, he will be a stop from pleading diplomatic immunity. Well, that's the position in law. Well, can I, can I, can uh, I stop you there? Stop. I, can I stop you there? Because actually, you may be mistaken, sure. because I want to go back to the actual details of the Vienna Convention. There is, first of all, Article 32.3, and separately, there is Article 32.4. Article 32.3 makes it very clear that if he approaches a court, he is automatically waiving his immunity from jurisdiction. But Article 32.4 distinguishes between immunity from jurisdiction and immunity in respect of execution. Let me quote that to you. Waiver of immunity from jurisdiction... No. Let me quote it to you because it's important. Waiver of immunity from jurisdiction in respect of civil or administrative proceedings shall not be held to imply waiver of immunity in respect of the execution of the judgment, for which a separate waiver will be necessary. That separate waiver is additional and missing. Therefore, I put it to you, in the absence of that separate waiver, can the Supreme Court's order to the ambassador not to leave the country be enforced? It's possible to infer an implied waiver. Besides, the point which I made and possibly wasn't articulate, that apart from the immunity waived or not, he will be a stopped, a stop from pleading the uh, convention, a stop by his acts, by which he got some benefit from the Supreme Court. So Supreme Court says, sorry, we are not interested in that. Okay. You gave us an undertaking. The full knowledge of the convention, the full knowledge of what the undertaking means, comply with it. Let me, let me put That's that... That's the point. Let me put that point to Kamal Sibyl, who, as a diplomat, is also, in a sense, a practitioner of the Vienna Convention. He may not be a lawyer like you, Soli Sarabji, but he actually has worked at implementing it and living up to it. Now, Kamal Sibyl, do you accept the two arguments made there by Soli Sarabji? One, that there can be an implied waiver, and therefore, by approaching the Supreme Court, maybe the second implied waiver is to be taken as given. And the second one is that the ambassador can be stopped. Do you accept both those two points, Kamal Sibyl? No, I don't. No, of course, I, I have full respect for Mr. Soli Sorabji, and he knows the law much better than I do. But uh, in my understanding, I'm very clear in my mind that there has to be an express waiver uh, given by the government of Italy. And in fact, this provision in the Vienna Convention about express waiver is precisely to remove any possibility of construing waiver in such a manner that you can imply it. Because then it is very open and uh, open-ended. And, and in various circumstances, people can read an implication when it is not there. Uh, number two, what you said about the two uh, di different articles of the Vienna Convention. One is a two-stage process. In the first case, the government of uh, Italy, in this case, can grant a waiver, uh, 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 diplomatic immunity. But if after the proceedings are over, automatically the judgment cannot be applied. A second waiver has to be given Quite by right. the government of Italy. And so that it's a two-stage process. And this 
uh, that strengthens the diplomatic immunity of the head of mission of any country. Let me then bring in Mr. Bhadra Kumar, because Mr. Bhadra Kumar, that second waiver, which would in fact allow the Indian government to enforce any order from the Supreme Court, is patently missing. Therefore, come back to my original hypothetical question. What would happen if 24 or 36 hours down the road, the Italian ambassador decides he wants to leave the country, or he's recalled by his government to go back for consultations? What would the Indian government do? Stand aside and let him go? That's possibility one. Or stop him at the airport on the grounds that the Supreme Court has said he can't leave? Possibility two. Or perhaps in some other way physically try and detain and arrest him? Possibility three. What would the government do, Mr. Kumar? Actually, precious little the government can do under the circumstances, unless there is a waiver specifically from Rome. And there is certainly no question of physically intimidating him at the border, you know, that if he wants to leave the country, if he wants to leave Indian soil, because he is a diplomat, he enjoys full immunity. And there is nothing the government of India can do about it. Which also means that the Supreme Court order not to leave the country is unenforceable. Would you agree with that, Mr. Bhadra Kumar? Yes, I would imagine so. I think that's the way to see it. Then a third quick question before I go to Mr. Sorabji, who's nodding his head in disagreement. Has the Supreme Court by its order today further complicated an already difficult problem, or at least further complicated it from the point of view of the Indian government? No. That is not necessarily so, because I saw a statement by the ambassador that he is prepared for a very, very long stay in India, and that he would be happy about it. Uh, forgive me, that so statement, forgive me, can I interrupt you? Okay, can I interrupt you? That statement was issued yesterday before the Supreme Court order of this morning. It doesn't necessarily amount to you're a right. response to the Supreme Court. No, you're right. Now, now we are uh, stepping onto the domain of uh, realistic possibilities. Uh, you know, after, uh, you know, splitting the law and, you know, finally, minutely looking at it. Now, uh, what will happen is that the Italian ambassador may not force the issue. Well, that, forgive me, I'm, in, I, I'm interrupting you again. I, I'm interrupting you again because if the Italian ambassador chooses not to force the issue, that would be an act of goodwill on okay. his part. He has a right if he wants to force the yes. issue. And therefore, I ask this yes. question again. If he chooses to force the issue, the Indian government will face a piquant problem created by the Supreme Court's order. That follows, doesn't it? If he forces the issue, there is going to be a problem. But right from the beginning, there is a certain consistency on the part of the Italians, which is that they wouldn't do anything which would uh, hurt the relationship. That's your interpretation. Secondly, Forgive me, I, I'm stopping you there. That's your interpretation and your surmise. The point I want to underline, because I think it's important, is that if the ambassador chooses to force the issue, which he may or may not do, but if he chooses to force the issue, and which may be his right to do, there will be a problem for the Indian government. You do accept that, don't you, Mr. Bhadra Kumar? It's a critical point. Of course, of course. It's a critical point, and if he forces the issue, uh, our helplessness in the matter, the government of India's, uh, will be completely exposed. Okay. That is help it is helpless when it comes to the enforcement of the Supreme Court order. Absolutely. Let me bring in Mr. Surabji. You've been nodding your head in dis... I'll come to you in a moment, Sam, Mr. Sibyl. First, Mr. Surabji, you were nodding your head in disagreement. Then Which Sibyl, of the two no, do you uh, want to disagree with? <clears throat> Look, under the Constitution, the government and everybody is bound to carry out the order of the Supreme Court to enforce it. If the Supreme Court has passed such an order, you can challenge it, good or bad, so long as the order is enforced, it has to be enforced. Even if it's in breach of the Vienna Convention the and even if it means that you could end up with a bigger that crisis? You no, Karan, we are not interested in making the Supreme Court a political football of different governments. Order is passed. If that order is to be vacated, let the ambassador go and say, vacate the order. You can't pass such an order. All right, let so me... long as the order is operative, it has to be enforced. Let and me... that's the obligation of our government under the Constitution. Let me, let me put that to Mr. Campbell Sibyl. Mr. Campbell Sibyl, do you accept the argument that once the Supreme Court has passed an order, the Indian government has to enforce it? It cannot, as Mr. Surabji is suggesting, plead that its hands are tied by the Vienna Convention? 
I think uh, this order would be unenforceable, uh, and it will mean a very serious violation of the Vienna Convention. What the government can do, in case the Italian ambassador chooses uh, to resist the order of the Supreme Court not to leave the country, is to quickly declare him persona non grata and expel him from the country. Which is the that way is, the, That is the action the government can take and should take. But that would, in effect, be a way of circumventing the problem by choosing to expel him instead. Yes. That's the only way out. Because, uh, you know, our ambassadors abroad and ambassadors of other countries abroad are also governed by the Vienna Convention, so we can't play ducks and drakes with that. It will have repercussions all over. Very quickly, Mr. Bhadra Kumar, on that point, if the Indian government were to follow not Kamal Sibyl's advice, but the advice of Mr. Sorabji, and choose to enforce an order in violation of the Vienna Convention and do so by either detaining the ambassador and not, letting him leave, and not letting him leave the country or worse still by arresting him, what are the chances that the European Union and the rest of the world will support us and what are the chances that the European Union will choose to stand by Italy, a critical leading member of that union itself? Now, I have no doubt whatsoever if uh, we um, Try, if we sidestep the Vienna Convention and uh, undertake any of these measures, as you uh, said, you mentioned, this, any of this, either of these two, uh, there's going to be very serious diplomatic repercussions, and the European Union can be expected to stand as a single entity, and we'll be virtually coming up against Fortress Europe. All right, gentlemen. No doubt about it. Let's take a quick break at that point. When I come back, I want to put you what many believe will be the actual explanation given by the ambassador to the Supreme Court on Monday about why his government refuses to return the Marines. How will that wash with the Supreme Court and what sort of issue or problem might it create for the Indian government? That's in a moment's time. See you after the break. We're discussing the Indian Supreme Court and the Italian ambassador. So, Lee Sarabji, it's believed that in his reply to the Supreme Court on Monday, the Italian ambassador will explain his government's decision not to return the Marines by citing four facts. First, that the Supreme Court itself had recommended a diplomatic solution, which was an idea acceptable to the Italians, but not to the Indians. Second, by pointing out that the Supreme Court had kept open the issue of jurisdiction when it said that the Italian government could challenge it in a special court. Thirdly, that that special court itself hasn't been set up even though two months have lapsed. And finally, by pointing out that once the Supreme Court quashed the case at the Kerala High Court, there are no charges pending against the Marines in India to answer. Now, as someone who understands the Supreme Court better than most people, how will the court respond to that sort of answer? I think he'd be only aggravating his contempt. Look, Karan, he gave an unconditional undertaking. It's not a condition about setting up a court or this or that. Unconditional undertaking. With full knowledge, with full consciousness. And you can't say thereafter that no, because of a reason X, Y or Z, I can't do it. Okay. He may plead his inability. And say, okay, well, I'll try my best. If I can't get them home in particular time, I'll get it. But to say this, look, please understand. I don't know. Maybe others uh, know better than I. Does diplomatic immunity cover acts like the contempt of Supreme Court with a sui generis offense? It's not an Indian penal court offense. It's not a traffic offense. It's an offense of committing a fraud in the court. All right. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me put that... And one, minute, and, and one thing, and one thing, uh, couple, uh, civil rightly said, uh, you can't infer implication, but by necessary implication, it's okay. a well settled principle of law. If okay. any party has any benefit on him, he can wield the benefit. Okay, let, let, let me stop you there. I want to go to Kamal Sibyl. Kamal Sibyl, I don't want to go back into this question of waiver implied, waiver, etc., because that was the discussion done in part one. I want to stick to the substantive issue about how the Supreme Court would respond to the Italian ambassador's reply if it comes along the lines I indicated. What is the 
key issue here is that, in fact, today, after the Kerala High Court case was quashed, there are no charges against the Marines. There is therefore no good legal reason other than the undertaking that they should have to come back. How does the Indian government respond to the fact there are no charges today? I think Mr. Soli Sorabji is absolutely right that an undertaking was given, an unconditional undertaking was given, and the ambassador and the Italian government are obliged to bring back the Marines. That's it. They cannot use any argument at this stage. Whatever arguments he wants to use, okay. those arguments will have to be used when the case is heard by the special court. I'm Number not... two, I am not sure that he can, he will necessarily answer the Supreme Court. He, he can easily, uh, the Italian government can make a statement in, in Rome. Quite explaining right. their position. Absolutely. Or, but, but, or but, the but, Italian ambassador can write to the Ministry of External Affairs. Quite right. But explaining let's, the position because he'll be subjecting I, himself I, again I, to the jurisdiction I understand. of the Supreme Court. I understand. Replies. There are many ways in which he can choose to respond without having to necessarily do it the way I indicated. But finally, Mr. Bhadra Kumar, to you. Do you go by the point made by both Soli Sarabji and Kamal Sibul, who in this instance do agree with each other, that a solemn, a solemn sovereign undertaking cannot be breached and then explained in some way. Once it's given, it's unconditional. There can be no excuse or explanation that justifies breaching it. A very quick answer, because we're really out of time. I'm not very uh, sure about it, that I can agree with that point of view, because, you know, Italian government, it's a sovereign government. It's a sovereign country. And they have taken a position, which I believe they reiterated today, that uh, this is an international dispute and that they are not going to subject themselves to Indian laws. Okay. So qualitatively, there is a different situation today also uh, since the time the affidavit gave, affidavit, affidavit was given. Now, we must understand that he is the representative of the government of Italy, and he is not acting individually. Okay. The Italian government has clearly stated that it doesn't think that you know, it is answerable to the Indian laws. All right. I would have to stop you there. You're giving a view that is very different to that of Soli Sarabji and Kamal Sibyl. You believe that, in fact, the Italian government has a right to change its mind. In effect, that's what you're saying. And it is a position that the ambassador can legitimately take. That is very different to the point made by Soli Sarabji and Kamal Sibyl when it comes to a question of breaching an unconditional undertaking. We're going to have to end this debate there. On Monday, we'll know precisely what the Italian ambassador does say, and we'll also then know how the Supreme Court responds. Till then, goodbye, good night.